you good? Wait till people come from the outside here. <laughs> uh, welcome those who are just coming to join us. I know a lot of you students have classes, so you're weaving in and out, and we appreciate it. I'm going to let my good friend and former colleague, Sarah Seidner, introduce her panel. Um, they are terrific. George and I have known each other for years. George is actually an IU grad, and George, you're going to have your problems with these three women up here, so <laughs> hold your own here. Hello, everybody. Um, I've just come off a whirlwind tour. That is a news tour, which you know is unpleasant sometimes, um, and I'm so happy to be here at IU again. And also, thank you for this weather. I'm sure this is not normal. Uh, for February. Uh, it wasn't like this last year. Um, joining me on this panel are some incredible people. They are changing the way that we see news. Um, I'm going to start here with Nikki Kelly. She is right next to me, this wonderful woman here. Um, Editor-in-chief of the Indiana Capital Chronicle. That means she can hire you. <laughs> for those who are looking. Um, an independent nonprofit newsroom launched last year to fill the gap caused by decreased resources for Indiana government and policy coverage. One of the things I think across the country that is happening is there's a decrease in covering local government issues that, by the way, are the first thing to affect you. So. Um, really important. Uh, Aikota Ofori Atta is co-founder and chief audience officer of Capital B, a local and national news organization reporting for black communities specifically. Uh, she was previously managing editor at The Trace. Welcome. And George Papajohn. Don't ask him for pizza. He's not related. Um, wait, are you? I'm not rolling in the dough. <laughs> <laughs> There you, there you go. go. Uh, I've been asked more than once. <laughs> I know you have. <laughs> um, he's led major uh, investigations at three different news organizations. He's currently the Midwest editor for ProPublica. Um, anyone who's familiar with any of the work of these three folks knows that they know what they're doing, even though I think a lot of times we question that, which is good. We're sh we should be constantly questioning if we are doing the right thing. Um, I, I certainly do for myself. Um, I'm going to start um, with you down at the end, and we'll go this way, um, George. Let's start with the, the first thing. Tell, tell us a little bit about how ProPublica works, okay. um, because these are news organizations that are not your typical mainstream ABC, CBS, CNN uh, organizations, but they have played a really important role in, I mean, we, I was about to quote you guys last night um, for something that you guys right. uncovered. Right. Um, so I'm part of the ProPublica's um, local news operation, which came into existence really about six years ago and has been really uh, a bastion of experimentation. Um, as, as you all know, the, uh, the local news industry is in quite a bit of disarray, and ProPublica, which was very much founded and made its name uh, through national news and national scoops and exclusives, uh, began about, about during that period to try to find a way to help fill the gaps in local news. And so there's basically what has emerged in the last few years, I, I would say, is a multi, you know, multi-pronged effort. Um, I'm part of that effort now as as the bureau chief uh, in Chicago for the Midwest bureau. We have people in in five states. Um, so setting up regional offices is is one of those uh, potential solutions. We have about a dozen reporters who cover the Midwest looking for investigative stories and accountability stories that nobody else is doing. But there are other ways too uh, that the that local news is 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 being approached by ProPublica. Um, there's something called the Local Reporting Network, where um, and I think this is really kind of a cool thing. Every every quarter we evaluate proposals from news organizations across the country from reporters who would like to work with ProPublica. Um, and as part of that um, opportunity, we, we get to work on some great ideas, but we also then pay their salary. So this sort of incentivizes uh, the news organizations to let us work with their reporters. Um, we give them editing, we give them data help, we give them whatever help uh, they might need. And so that's called the Local Reporting Network, sort of an ongoing series of, um, of partnerships that are formalized in the last year. I got involved with one when I first uh, started at ProPublica. It was supposed to last a year. Um, it did last, it did, we did stop paying her salary after a year. 
but we still work together. So we develop these also these informal relationships with people uh, that we respect and have mutual respect um, and, and work together on. And then finally, we, we also um, have developed fellowships for individual reporters in which we um, work with them for a period of two years. Uh, they will be with their news organization. Again, we pay their salary. Uh, we co-publish with their news organization. We work with their editors and uh, we publish stories together. But it, it, it allows, again, that news organization to feel comfortable giving their reporter um, that level of commitment to work on longer term projects as opposed to the quicker turns. I wish you were around when I was a young person. <laughs> That's over now. Um, I, I do want to brag on you just for a second, and on ProPublica in particular, um, because um, I, you all, I'm sure, are aware of the uh, train derailment um, that turned into a toxic mess in East Palestine, Ohio. Um, and last night, ProPublica published something that made me jump up and down. Um, the headline is, that a Norfolk Southern policy lets officials order crews to ignore safety alerts. Um, and that just came out last night. It's a great read if you're interested. Um, but that's the sort of thing that they come with that sometimes other or news organizations who are chasing the CEO, we, we chased down the CEO, we got him to agree to sit down and talk to us. But those things come up, and it's really important to have an organization say, let's immediately start digging. Not just do nuts and bolts, let's immediately jump into look at the past, look at their record, let's see if there's anything that we can find, and somehow ProPublica nails it every time. Um, Akoto, you serve a very specific purpose, and, and I was really impressed when I talked to you um, as we got ready for this panel, that you're really trying to do news you can use, things that people, they need, so that they need to read you because you are offering them something that helps enhance their life. Talk about the work that you all do at Capital B. Yeah, um, first I'll start by saying uh, glad to be here. Um, I think we all um, do, you know, the journalism conference circuit all the time, and my favorite thing to do is talk to students, so I'm happy to be here. So um, <clears throat> Capital B is a local and national news organization that covers um, or reports for black communities across the country. And in 2020, which I think is now shorthand for just a very terrible time. Um, you know, COVID, particularly for black people, COVID was disproportionately impacting us. Um, you know, the Breonna Taylor and George Floyd protests. And uh, me and my co-founder, Lauren Williams, who was the senior vice president and editor-chief at Vox.com, that's V-O-X, sometimes people think I'm saying Fox. Um, you guys have all read Vox, right? You guys know what Vox is? Okay. Um, so we came together and, and we're, you know, after, you know, having been in various newsrooms, for, dec for two decades um, combined, thought, what can we do now? Like, w there was an, we felt an urgency to sort of take our talent and our experience in journalism and just do something specifically for black Americans. And so um, we identified two problems um, or two challenges or two things that we wanted to sort of work towards solutions for. Um, one is that national news um, has historically just gotten um, stories about race and racism and black life wrong, um, just missing perspectives um, that just were not being covered in part because these newsrooms were not diverse and, and there are few, uh, you know, people of color in leadership. That was one side. The other side is that I think if you're a journalist working in any part of news today, um, you're concerned about what's happened to local news, right? Like, um, without getting into it uh, too much, but advertising models have been pretty much decimated, and that is the main way that papers have made news for decades, right? Like, the um, the rise of the internet, Facebook, Twitter, all that has just sort of changed the way that papers can make money. And so with that means that you have fewer uh, local journalists, fewer papers, and that really impacts the information that people are, need to get to make decisions about how they live their lives. And so what we wanted to do was um, create an organization that proposed solutions for those challenges, right? A national, on our national side, we do stories um, about big national issues with a black perspective. Um, on the local side, we do that too, but we also are trying to really f like give 
black residents the information they need to be civically engaged, to just navigate their city, right? Like there are so many questions that people have about um, life. Like how do I get my kid registered in school? Like what is actually going on with voting laws here? What are the ways that I can access this, you know, tax benefit that the governor just signed? Um, these are things that people just need to know that I think often, uh, Local, the decimation of local news has has made that harder, but also that like not too many newsrooms have been prioritizing, and so um, that's what we do at Capital B. And uh, we have our first our first local newsroom is in Atlanta, and we just announced that our second will launch in Gary, Indiana, later this year. Congratulations! Everybody knows Gary, Indiana, because of one particular person. <laughs> I was a fan. One, yes. Yes. Good if old you're Michael. Rap too. Uh, oh, might know, you might, that's, you might that's know true. Freddie Gibbs. That's true. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, the work that you are both doing, all three of you, uh, it, important. Like I think sometimes we we sort of you know like oh you know just your head down, you're trying to get stuff done. Um, but these are things that people actually need to know, and it's been stripped out of their daily news diet, if you will, um, if they're even on a news diet at all. Um, Nikki, tell me about what you're doing, um, because I find it really, really interesting, the focus that you all have. Uh, yeah, so the Capital Chronicle launched in June. We are part of a national nonprofit a group called States Newsroom, and they came together back in 2017 to specifically address the lessening of coverage of state government, state policy. I can give you an example. I worked at the Fort Wayne Journal Gazette for more than 20 years covering the legislature. When I first arrived at the legislature in 1999, there were at least two dozen newspapers, TVs, who had their own reporter, you know, based at the state house covering government all day every day we, we might have 10 now you know uh, much of the cities have had to close their bureaus and things like that so that's the kind of gap that we are trying to fill so we have a pretty specific focus on the state house state policies government um, we're in the middle of session right now which is a very busy time we have three three reporters plus me oh and we hired an IU intern for the summer so pretty excited about that mm -hmm. and um, we're just trying to use this new model, which is nonprofit, so we're online. We are no paywall, no ads, but if anyone wants to donate, please do. <laughs> um, and trying to use this new model and see what we can bring Indiana. Um, another thing that's uh, significant about State's Newsroom and, and the Capital Chronicle is we have what's called a Creative Commons license. Um, and so what that means is that all of our stuff can be republished for free by other newspapers, other radio stations, other TV stations. And so that's helping a lot of smaller newspapers in rural Indiana uh, put things out for their, their citizens who need to know. Maybe they can't afford Associated Press anymore. Um, so that helps educate Hoosiers in general about what's going on at the State House, what they're up to, and how it impacts you on a daily basis. Um, really, those sorts of things, I don't think we realize how important it is. Because uh, typically, you know, the news was supposed to be a watchdog for the government, right? That's why they call us the fourth estate. And that just kind of changed um, for lots of different reasons, some of them not so great, uh, some of them embarrassing, I think, to news organizations. Um, Akoto, I, I'm going to start with, with sort of asking you about what you were proud of. You, you, you talked to me about a couple of pieces, and I'll kind of go down the line. What is a story that stood out for you um, that, and, and perhaps surprised people um, that, you, that you did that you felt like this had an impact? Um, this did the thing that we wanted it to. We want this to be about. Oh, so many. Um, we just turned. We just turned a year, and so um, I've had you know the pleasure to just like look back at all the stories we've published, and I've this is all of this is sort of fresh in my mind. So um, I would say I would start with. Um, our coverage of the Jackson water crisis in Mississippi. Um, we have a rural issues reporter on our national team, but she's from Mississippi. And so she lives in DC now, but she uh, went back home and she covered the crisis um, from, you know, the black neighborhood's perspective. And the best part about that story was that about a quarter or a third of the traffic of that story came from Jackson. Now, mind you, this is a story that has been covered nationally, right? Like every big Everybody. was on it. Yep. And to us, that was a real signal that like, you know, people were coming to Capital B because we were offering a perspective that just wasn't 
in the mainstream. Um, you know, and I think that there are, going back to that service journalism piece that I talked about, um, when Governor Kemp in Georgia um, had announced the COVID relief in, in people's tax returns, there was a lot of confusion about like how people can access it. And so our state and local politics reporter did a piece on how do I get my tax break. Um, it's Atlanta's number one piece. It has been at the top. For, it stayed there for uh, a very, very long time. And that, again, is just sort of proof of that, like, you know, as journalists, we have to, I'll just say, and like, as we talk, you Go will there. learn that I'm more radical about these things than most. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that a lot of the journalism that people really need is not, is not just the stuff that is like winning Pulitzers, right? Like, that work is the kind of work that is like award-winning, or the kind of work that like prize judges prize is like, the, you know, it's not, it's, it's slow, it's often things that have an impact, but it takes a really long time. And I think that like that metric for, you know, what is a successful piece is, is not the most important thing that we need to be focused on in the industry right now. People need to feel informed and people need to feel empowered with the information that they have. People need to feel um, equipped to make decisions about what is happening in their lives. And that kind of stuff can have immediate impact on people's lives, right? Like we talk about trust in the industry all the time. I think that if you, I'd worked for you know a gun violence outlet for, for years and we covered the NRA for a long time. Um, you know, did a lot of great work around that organization, had a lot of impact, don't know if kids who are living in, you know, cities with high gun violence could really feel the impact of that piece. Not sure. Um, but maybe if you are revealing to people, like, what does your city offer to, um, you know, survivors of gun violence? Like, what are resources there that they can use and tap into? Maybe that has more of an immediate impact. And so just really thinking about you know, what people actually need to know and writing and doing reporting for that I think is really, really important. George, um, ProPublica um, has, I, I don't think there's a subject you guys have not done some sort of investigation on uh, widely, whether it be immigration. I think that's the first time I really noticed ProPublica, mm -hmm. but you have done on so many things. Is there something specific that you, you felt particularly um, proud of or that you felt like had a, an impact, made it made a change. I'll preface this by saying I've only been a ProPublica a little over a year, so um, we can we can also go back. <laughs> we can no, go well, back to previous. I will say that that there was one story that um, was just in its beginning stages that then I, I uh, helped helped lead to over the finish line uh, last year, and it was called the Price Kids Pay, and it was based in Illinois. And it, it, it's sort of a classic, I think, piece of journalism that was something that was going on every day in schools, every day in sort of these obscure um, administrative buildings in municipal halls um, and involving students, involving a question of equity, a question of fairness, um, in which students um, were being ticketed for their behavior in school. So um, you get caught with a vape pen you um, have a fight over um, a snack in the lunchroom and you end up in a shoving match. Um, you, um, even for truancy, um, you end up with a, getting the police involved in some of these schools, not all schools, but many, many schools are reporters found. Were, were um, there fines? And there were fines, there you go, <laughs> exactly. So, Rather than the school, the typical thing, you know, I have a son, he gets his detention for punching the kid in the playground the other day, um, and uh, but he doesn't get a ticket. Um, in these schools, you would get a ticket and potentially, and then you go to these administrative hearings where you have no representation, you show up, it's basically, you know, the same type of hearing that you would have if you were like um, had a had a speeding ticket, or you had uh, maybe your lawn had gotten unruly, and you had you had violated a municipal um, the, the municipal code. Um, they're set up for sort of to quickly find people, quickly punish adults, um, and instead these students were being funneled in there. Um, they were basically missing school oftentimes because they were being sent there. 
Um, and they were subjected, basically you lose. It's basically, in, in, in essence, it's not a an innocent until proven guilty system. It's a guilty until proven innocent type system. Um, you get generally come away with fines and administrative hearing fees. And if you don't pay the fines, uh, they can then send debt collectors after you. <laughs> Um, and this was happening, this had been happening across Illinois for years and years, despite the fact that there is a law on the books that students should not be fined for truancy. Um, and that there was a law on the books that um, schools could not fine students for misbehavior. The schools were saying, well, we, we're not doing it. <laughs> the police are doing it. Um, but they were the ones who were handing over the kids to the police. Um, and this was a story that got immediate reaction. Um, the, 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 um, the Board of Ed um, in, in Illinois um, sent out, um, the, expressed its desire for this to change. Unfortunately, they don't have a lot of power in that respect. However, um, it does appear, I just learned this week, that the legislature is taking this up so we could get additional laws on the books. We're beginning to go back and survey the school districts across the state and are finding that many have backed off this. The second largest district in Illinois uh, backed off fining and ticketing students and uh, the comptroller's office in Illinois said it will no longer assist municipalities in collecting these fines. And finally, we did write um, a follow-up story about racial inequities in this type of ticketing and the attorney general's office in Illinois is looking at that. So that, that to me is sort of maybe classic ProPublica, classic accountability yeah. journalism that you really end up feeling good about because you feel like you've hopefully are gonna make a difference in the long run. You and Akoto had very different stories, both very impactful. I mean, something that people, especially when you hit people's pocketbooks, especially now um, with right. the way things are going in the economy. All right, um, Nikki story that you enjoyed, thought did something for society? Well, we're at less than a year old, but I will say we, we kind of got thrown in. We were launching the end of June, and normally that would be kind of the summer slow time in the state house. The session isn't normally till January, but we suddenly had a special session that was going to pop up like three weeks after we launched. And so uh, looking back, it was the greatest thing because it allowed us to really show people what we could do quickly. Uh, and it was originally called for a quick little rebate to the taxpayers because we had some extra money in our surplus. But instead, it became an abortion session because of the Dobbs case. So they were doing a two to three week session on banning abortion. So an example of a story that I think made a big impact is a couple weeks before the session started, uh, we had one of our reporters who does a lot of our sort of social services, healthcare um, stuff, and she really looked at the number of babies that would be brought into, the, into Indiana and would not have services. She looked at a bunch of programs that were underfunded, had waiting lists for children, for mothers. Um, and later they added a second bill that specifically put, I think in the end they decided like 40 to 50 million toward these programs that I consider to be was a, a recognition that, well, if, if we're gonna force people to give birth, then we're gonna have to provide some services to them that we're not living up to now. So I think that was the first indication that I could see um, we, could, we could make some, some headway there. I am going to open this up um, because I'll talk to y'all all day and just like it's my own, you know, living room. Is there anyone, if you have questions, um, yell them out and I'll repeat them. Uh, if you don't have questions, I will continue chewing their ear. Are there any questions out there for any one of these panelists? Way in the back. Uh, Nikki, you want to? I see you shaking well, your head. Well, no, I mean because we're newer, and this is the the whole nonprofit journalism thing is pretty new to Indianapolis. I definitely have a lot of people asking questions, and and they want to understand how it works and what the catch is. Um, and so I, I'm talking to them a lot about just how it works. There's no catch. I 
it's funny, I, I'm great friends with a number of Indianapolis Star reporters, and I know that, you know, they have one state house reporter, and we have three, <laughs> and, you know, she's constantly feeling a little behind the mark because she can't get to everything, nor, nor should she, she's one person. Um, so we're getting a little bit of that, um, not not in a bad way at all, though. I think everyone's pretty supportive of seeing uh, some additional new, uh, I guess, new ways to approach journalism that you know might be sustainable. We hope for the future. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd say that um, one of the things that's really great about nonprofit news, one is that there's. I don't even know if it's right to call it a wave, but you know, nonprofit news and emerging models are very much a part of conversations people are having about where the industry needs to go. Um, secondly, the you know, I think one of the best parts of, of this work is that you know, collaboration is really sort of at the core of how it works. Um, the notions of competition on the nonprofit side are just very different than the notions of competition on the for-profit side. And so what you find is that um, Often traditional media understands that you know we want to be collaborative. Um, we have a great working relationship with the Atlanta Journal Constitution, um, and you know I think that there there might be some skeptics here and there, but overall I think the industry is really starting to under, understand that um, you know some of the work that we can do on our side because of our structure is really valuable to share with our audiences. George. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely been an evolution. My my previous position um, was at the Chicago Tribune as the investigations editor. And I can tell you that mm, if it was maybe 10 years ago, there was a lot of resistance to working with a ProPublica or a nonprofit. Um, I was, you know, I knew people in the industry and I always felt like a great idea is a great idea and that's sort of the gold, you know, that you're sort of sifting for every day. And then if somebody were to come to me with a great idea, why would I turn it down? Or if somebody were to come to me with a really skilled reporter whom I can work with, um, why would I turn that down? That was not necessarily the view uh, in other quarters of the newsroom it, because it was a lot of people that had grown up, including myself, with the idea that it's competition. Right. Right. These are the people at that other place. No matter whether it's a for-profit, a non-profit, whatever it is. I'm there to beat them, they're there to beat me and make me look bad. And um, so there was a lot of resistance over the years as I tried to forge those relationships. I was able to do that from time to time. And now in my new role and with a new editor at the Chicago Tribune, there's no problem you know, making those connections. I think you know, everybody has come to realize the advantages of collaborations. And I'll just say from, because I'm in the, in the mainstream, mm -hmm. <laughs> from, from my perspective, I'm just jealous. Like, to be honest, like sometimes I see, you know, on social media it tends to be pretty negative. Well, some of it, like Twitter's for haters, we know this, but, um, uh, but, and I'm on it, so I guess I'm also a hater, but yeah, what I notice is usually the criticism is that's not going to work. Like this, that's not going to work. Um, and so we have a penchant to be negative. Um, we are taught sort of to look for the negative, look for the problem, look for the, right? Um, and so sometimes I think that's the, when you do get pushback, it's usually either we're jealous, <laughs> and I'll just put that right out there, or it's this negative thing that we do. It's like, oh, that's not going to last. So, mm -hmm. you know, people are reticent to like jump into it, even though when they hear what you're doing, they're like, well, that, that sounds kind of good, uh, too good to be true, or, you know what I mean? It's, it's that kind of mentality, I think, um, a little bit. Does anyone else have anything? Oh, lots of questions. I'm going to repeat for those of you in the back that might not be able to hear. She said, how do you navigate this world we live in where um, we are, we're all taught initially the big J journalism was to give both sides a chance to say their piece and give equal weight to both sides. But if one side is, and, and the, you know, some of this is politics, but some of this is other things. If one side is lying or is hateful or is putting false information out there and the other side isn't, how do you deal with balancing all of that? Do you give equal weight? Um, no. I knew that is what you were going to say. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, 
capital B um, in many newsrooms, ha we have a point of view, right? Um, I don't know, racism, bad. Democracy, good. Like, those are things we're not shy about. Those are things that um, are just taken for granted in our work and our reporting. And so I don't actually think that these, those models of objectivity have served us very well, actually. Um, I think that, uh, you know, if you talk to a lot of black journalists who had, um, you know, been wanting to, before Trump, during Obama, wanting to write specific stories about the racial animus that was sort of bubbling up to the surface and, you know, the pushback that they got, um, you'll, you'll see there that, like, it doesn't, it, it did not help us in any way to not have those, to have those stories muffled, right? And so I think that um, taking, a, having a position, I don't think it's, I don't think it's controversial to say that like, you know, we want uh, people to feel free and safe and to be able to, you know, live freely is not um, something that you need to sort of like remove from your reporting. I mean, I think, speak for all of us, like we, you know, the work that we do is so that people can, we can just have a more equitable society and a, and a better future. Um, I just wanted to say on this one, we have this issue a lot because in, in just this week we've had two major bills that target uh, transgender youth. And so when you've got a four hour hearing and, and you're listening to, you know, either the pro testimony or the, or the oppo opposition testimony, I mean, I mean, first of all, we automatically just ignore anything we know to be false. We're, we're just not going to print anything false. And then I think I, I, we still have an obligation, whether we agree or not, to, to get somewhat of the opposite side in. But we definitely take an opportunity to point out studies, to refute things uh, with data, with, you know, other other positions like that. So you'll see that in us a lot too. Well, you know, if there's something kind of on the edge, it's, it's, it's not inaccurate, but it's maybe a little misleading. We'll try to at least try to put some context in there for it. I mean, and to me, it, it's always remained, um, the goal is to do the work so you can write with authority mm -hmm. and you can, mm -hmm. you can feel comfortable um, telling things the way they are. Um, and I, you know, we've had to deal a lot with election denialism in this country and in, in, in the Midwest Bureau, we've spent a lot of time writing about it in Wisconsin. And what I really appreciate about our, our reporter there is that she, she treats it like she would anything else that she's done throughout her career. And she listens to the lawyers for some of these groups and the activists. Um, and and really, you know, tries to go to ground on it and and understand what their arguments are, and then if they're untrue, we can say they're untrue, and why. So, I, you know, to me, the the gold standard would be not to just say somebody said this and it's a lie or it's untrue. It's like why? Why is it? I'd rather mm -hmm. you know. I'd rather you know invoke. I'd rather invoke the cliche here of of show rather than tell. Yeah. Um, in the lovely, colorful shirt. <laughs> just so everyone is aware and make sure I get this right, um, from the queer or people of color um, perspective, um, the assertion is that there's not enough representation in newsrooms. Um, and why is that basically? And, and what needs to what needs to happen to, to make that um, a part of a newsroom, a, a, a normal regular part of a news, newsroom uh, society? Um, you know, it's been sort of, eye-opening for me to go, to come to ProPublica and see how the process works for hiring. And I'm, I'm not, I can't cite the numbers off the top of my head and, I'm, and I know that nobody is completely happy with, with our numbers, but I know that they're transparent with the numbers. 
I know that there's a process, there's a talent coordinator that I'm, I have a job opening currently that I'm working very closely with. And it gives me a sense of sort of like um, comfort and hope that we can have, a, that there is a process. I mean, I think one of the um, probably not um, two secret, dirty secrets about newsrooms of the past is that they were not necessarily well run, that, you know, it was sort of the traditional, you're a great reporter with killer instincts and you, you know, wrote a bunch of great stories, you become editor in chief, doesn't mean you can manage a newsroom. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, I always say that, you know, sort of I learned from the worst oftentimes uh, during my career, and that usually was not about the journalism, but on the management end. So I feel like there's a real effort in, in with my current employer, and actually as a BuzzFeed before that, I think there was an effort there too, to really sort of right the ship and do, do the right thing going forward. Um, and I think part of that goes back to why, how do we get good journalism? It's a good process. How do we get good hiring? It's a good process. It's an open process. Even something as simple as salaries now, ProPublica is putting, here's the salary range. Mm -hmm. Here's what we pay people. That was always a secret. I mean, it was always kept behind in some black box. So that to me is, 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 is some way forward at least. Yeah. Um, I know you, you asked about not just the hiring side, but also the story side. And I was thinking about that and I really think it's hard to untangle them. Um, and I think really what it comes down to is as newsroom leaders or as people who are in position to make things happen, you have to believe that you cannot do your work unless your newsroom is diverse. Like you have to really believe that, not like I have a quota I have to fill, you know, the, the as me diversity survey, survey is coming up and I don't want our newsroom to be embarrassed. Like not, that's, those are not the, the proxies, right? Like, we can't cover LG and LGBTQ issues if we don't have the representation in our newsroom. I can't, you know, cover, um, you know, anything without having people who are from those communities or have access to those experiences doing that work. And that, like, is something that you actually have to carry. And I found that the leaders who do do that um, make that diversity happen somehow. All of a sudden, there's you know you can you can these mysterious black and LGBTQ reporters <laughs> that you cannot find anywhere. Suddenly, people are getting hired because it's just you just have to be bullish about that and like just know that you can't actually do your work without making strides in that area. Yeah, I know. I learned um, that I we just had you have to take the extra step. I mean, is what it comes down to. Uh, we got a lot of applications for our, our openings. Almost all were women. Um, there was no one of color. There was no one, no Hispanics. Um, there were several queer candidates. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of interviewed a lot, but I also had to start reaching out on my own to people and to organizations to see if I could find some more candidates that would kind of fill out the diversity. But um, I think in the past, people just see what comes to them and kind of pick the best of it. So I definitely had to take extra steps to try to make sure we had uh, different people in the mix. I just want to give a quick example of why you know th there's been a lot of discussion about diversity these days, and it's um, it's fraught sometimes with the way that people pit put, you know pit people against each other. Um, but we we've had scenarios you know when we're talking in in our newsroom, and most of us have you know a morning meeting or a, a, an editorial meeting at some time in the day. Sometimes many of them, um, maybe too many meetings. You know, too you've many. been there too, too many. many. Um, and journalists typically don't like meetings so much. We just like to dig, <laughs> talk to other people. Um, but there were a couple of instances that I can I can recall in newsrooms where we had discussions, and because there was there did happen to be usually one, sometimes just me, um, person who was from a different community that did not experience the th same things with someone who would say, you know, we had no idea that. 
black folks were getting treated like this by the, the police until now, because now we have, you know, video. And, uh, you know, I, being me and with the big mouth, I said, well, you might not have had an idea, but everybody in the black community knew, right? And so th those are sort of the conversations that you have to have, but you also cannot, I always tell people this, one person cannot be the representative of an entire community. It's ridiculous. We wouldn't say that for folks who are white or black, uh, who are from the LGBTQ community, who are from the Native American. I mean, this notion that one person is going to solve that issue is a real problem because there's diversity in diversity. <laughs> um, and so I think having people from different socioeconomic backgrounds as well is really, really important. And that's, I think, one of the places that we really struggle because TV news early on is cheap. Sorry, but like they don't pay. And I know newspaper early on, you know, it's hard to make a living. I mean, it's minimum wage at best. Um, and so, you know, that's something I think we really need to, to work on. Any other questions? Yep, yes, hi. I remember you from last year. Anyway, hi. <laughs> Ooh, that's good. Any impact? I mean, always an impact, but she said, how is social media I can, I can, I could say a bit about um, ProPublica and then let you take it. But, <laughs> um, you know, I think that there's been, I think ProPublica is an is a example of a news organization that has really done a lot to, I guess, propel what we're now calling engagement journalism, mm -hmm. propel that forward, um, and using social to really drive important work. Um, I think the founding engagement editor, Terry Parrish, is that his name? Um, he was, I think he predated okay. me, but he's someone who just laid, a, laid the groundwork for mm -hmm. like, how do you really get people to talk to you about some right. of the things that they're going through? Um, one of ProPublica's like really early investigations um, around like veterans and um, that they had might may, may have been exposed to some harmful substances. All of that was sourced through social media. And like, I think that they are, you know, a model for, if you're not following them, they are a model for how people are using social media in really interesting ways. For us, we are, um, as we're, you know, just one year old and we're not like, I don't, I don't, we're not yet doing what I think most people would call investigative journalism as we conceive of it, but you know, we are using social media to ask people questions about like, what do you need to know that you don't know? Mm. Um, and how can we fill that need? And I think you know, often that work can become the groundwork for some more accountability enterprise investigative journalism. No, I think that's true. They, um, the, the audience team calls it, um, or the engagement team calls them call outs. And, it, and you probably can go on ProPublica website right now and find find a call out for some subject, um, and that obviously those same things go out uh, over social media. It's funny because in the earlier panel, there's sort of um, mainly negatives on social media, and I don't think we're trying to ignore the negatives of social media. We know they're there, but it 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 really can help you engage with your audience, um, and and even something as simple as I'm, I worked a little bit with this group in Detroit called Outlier Media, and their their whole um, their whole approach is is again to engage with the community to try to write things that um, matter, try to inform the community. Kind of similar. To, we to, love Outlier. You, I do too. Yeah, we <laughs> we worked with them, and they, their whole model is built around texting. And they um, we worked uh, again this local reporting uh, network that uh, ProPublica has. Um, they made a uh, Outlier made a pitch. Um, about um, utility shutoffs during COVID. They were able to uh, get their hands on some data that hadn't been published before mm -hmm. involving Detroit um, shutoffs. And um, you know what was key to that beyond the data was finding people and getting their experiences. And um, you know Sarah Alvarez over at Outlier was able to do that through their texting system. That's cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, reporting-wise, you still have to stick to the basics and, and, and nail down the stories. It does help a lot, um, from my perspective, to find sort of real people. That's the phrase we use a lot. You know, you want people to illustrate a story. So um, I, I keep I keep kind of track on who comments on things on Twitter or who comments on Facebook. Um, 
usually that means someone has an interest in a topic and you might be able to go back to them six months from now and say, hey, you know, we've looked into this and, and we found a lot of great sources that way. Um, I will generally engage with anyone on Twitter or Facebook um, as long as it's, you know, respectful. Um, and I find that it often works a lot in our favor. Gentleman here. I wanted to ask, since you know these are sort of new formats for journalism and are maybe not as institutionalized as other ones are, um, if there are organizations or ideals that you know you guys kind of want to build towards, if there are organizations you feel that are doing something right that you are trying to sort of take inspiration from, somewhere where you can point us to look at as well, if we're not you know looking for something to follow except for you guys. Um, I'm going to quickly just so that everyone, the question is uh, basically, you know, being new organizations who are doing things differently, are there guidelines, are there ideals that are being followed, or are there organizations that you emulate or want to emulate? Love this question. <laughs> um, in part because I think one of the reasons why we built Capital B is to sort of keep the things, the traditional things about journalism that we all value, all everyone in this room values, and sort of get rid of the stuff that is not working for us, right? So we've actually posted our, when we launched, we did post our um, operating principles, something that we share with everyone we hire, and, and it's um, public, and I can share the link somehow, and I'll share it all with you, but I think one of the things, you can go online and read it, but one of the things, one of the principles is that we are really being mindful about balance, right? Like this work can be very consuming. Um, you know, as journalists, we are all um, basically trying to understand the forces of American life. And like sometimes, sometimes those forces are really um, evil. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's sad. Sometimes it's very heavy. And, um, you know, you also have to do your job, but then also have to go home. And so one of our guiding principles is that um, our, our, our colleagues prioritize the health of their physical and, and mental health of themselves and of their family, right? Um, startups often have this like, we're a family ethos and like, you know, whatever. And we reject that. We are not a family at Capital B. We are a team. <laughs> People, you have your own family, like you need to, they need you to be there for them. Um, and uh, in order to do that, you need to be proactive about what you need when you're covering this work. And so I think the good news is, I think you guys will agree, is that I think you all are coming into an industry that is way more cognizant of that than it was when we all started, right? And so um, I feel happy about that and I feel really good about being a part of that change. That is such a great line. I, I mean, the whole thing about it being a family seems... It's a trick. Yes, right. It, it seems great, right? Because you, you love your family and they embrace you or they drive you crazy. So maybe that doesn't use room. <laughs> I got to give credit to my co-founder. Okay, but but <laughs> yeah, it, it, it presents this thing that you should have undying loyalty and you should give up your kidney or your, you know, the equivalent of whatever limb um, to that organization. And that set up people for these really sort of, um, you know, um, unbalanced lives. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're a team, I love that. I just think I'm going to steal that. If you stole it, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, I do think that there there has been, you know, a change in that way, too, in, yeah. in a lot of newsrooms. Um, you know, at ProPublica, you know, there's a new... Um, uh, policy for um, for new parents um, where you uh, get paid leave for several months and I'm just thinking back to when I first had kids and how that would have really been a lifesaver for for my family and it's just is fair and it just makes a lot of sense um, at BuzzFeed there were there was definitely because I was there in 2020 when everything was happening there was definitely a, um, an acknowledgement that people needed to take personal time, that people were being personally affected by these things. So I think that there has been a lot of um, positive change. I would also just say, just as far as things that I admire beyond that, um, I, I'm such a fan of local journalism, and I, I love the idea that you're going into Gary 
um, a place that needs coverage, um, that the Tribune in Chicago only would occasionally, when, when we had a huge staff, would only still occasionally cover, that the Post Tribune covered well for, you know, pretty well for a long time, but now has been fairly well decimated. I just, I love that idea. And again, my experience with Outlier in Detroit, I think is, 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 has been really um, eye-opening and I admire a lot of what they're doing because again, they're really trying to connect to the community and, and figure out what people need in their lives and connect their journalism to those needs. And just remember that all of the new things, like I get very excited when I see a new organization um, show up that is trying to do good work, whether it be nonprofit or whatever, these are jobs <laughs> that exist for journalists. Um, and the more the better, as far as I'm concerned, especially because of what's happened um, to, to local news in particular. Um, so, you know, donate. Because that's another, we'll talk about fundraising in a bit. Yeah. Did you want to add something? Yeah. Oh, no, go ahead. Um, on that note, we keep talking about outliers, mm -hmm. so I just want to say um, follow Outlier Media for sure, to answer your specific question. Um, follow City Bureau in Chicago. Um, and what I'm getting at is there is a, a very large movement um, happening right now, uh, rethinking the shape of our industry, right? Um, rethinking who we're doing this work for, rethinking how we're going to fund it so that it is sustainable, so that we can stop shuttering local newspapers all across the country. And Outlier specifically has been like part of pioneering that new thinking as well as City Bureau, thinking about how, how we make journalism more participatory, participatory, right? That like it's not just us in this room who can, you know, do digging and share information, but that this is a, a civic act that everyone can participate in, and how do we, as journalists, um, open that door to let more people come in and be a part of the, the news making, the information sharing um, practice. And so I think if you're looking for um, inspiration, those are at least two organizations that I would really follow closely. You've all, I think, worked in traditional, and you've now worked. You're now working in nonprofit. Um, I do. I am curious about funding and how that works, um, because obviously you need to be paid so that you can live your life as well. Um, what are the differences? Is there something that really stands out to you from one to the next? Well, um, the biggest difference I've seen so far is on. We we actually have a commentary page, which some. Nonprofits do, some nonprofits don't. And so uh, we have to be a little careful. We cannot uh, endorse candidates. We can't uh, likewise say don't vote for this candidate. <laughs> um, uh, I, we have a weekly columnist who's pretty progressive and I had to back him down a number of times during the election season so that we didn't lose our nonprofit status. Um, so that's the biggest difference I've seen. I, I get a lot of what's the catch and how are you funded and you know we're part of a national outlet. You can look online. We put our biggest funders there. We're trying to be very transparent but I also just tell people look give me a month. Sign up sign up to our newsletter, read some stories, give me a month, you decide what you want to put toward us as a monthly, like basically you pick your subscription price, you know, what you think we're giving you. And um, that's working really well so far. We have a lot of monthly recurring supporters. Um, some people prefer to give sort of one big chuck, some people prefer a little bit every month. And so um, it's, it's a lot of education for a brand new thing um, here in Indiana, but it's it's going really well. People are being very accepting. George, you want to? Um, I love nonprofit news. I um, I'm an evangelist of it. I think that one of the one of the best parts of it is that uh, you get to slow down a little bit. Um, you know, if you work for for a profit that is really chasing traffic to drive those ad dollars. Um, you know, it's it's you're you're probably putting out a lot of work that is not getting that may or not may or may not be getting read widely, putting out work that's burning you out, um, putting out work that you might not be proud of, and it, a lot of nonprofits you can really sort of sort of stay 
step back and take that time that you need to 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 do um, slower burn stories. Um, and again, going back to collaboration, I also think that's just a feature of nonprofit news that is really great. We, um, you had mentioned the Creative Commons. You know, you could just hop on their site. If I wanted to just publish anything I wanted, I could go to her site follow her rules and publish it on my site, and I think that's a really great thing for um, information sharing. And um, I also think that, you know, we need, we need new models. The, the, the for-profit model, is, it, does not, it has not worked. <laughs> so um, I think it is important that we have folks in the nonprofit world, in the for-profit world, rather, um, trying to figure out how to make it work, like we can't, we can't like just say to hell with all of that. That is <laughs> that is important. Um, but I also think that combining that with emergent models for funding this work is important. So we do have, um, we were able to raise before we launched nine million dollars um, from um, you know uh, foundations, and we also are uh, have a membership program that we hope to continue to build. We're also going to um, you know, generate corporate sponsorship money. And so really that sort of combined revenue, diverse revenue stream is really um, how we're approaching this work to make sure that we can fund it in the long term. So I was um, at the Chicago Tribune um, right after college um, and was there for more than three decades. And to perhaps sum up the last 10, 12 years of my time there, which uh, was when the industry had the most upheaval, is when I look back on that time, probably the most, the best time, the ideal time during that period was when we were in bankruptcy. So bankruptcy was actually better than being <laughs> run by Michael Farrow or Sam Zell or Alden because there was some sort of control over what was going on and things were kind of frozen. Um, when I went from the Tribune to BuzzFeed News, you would think, oh my God, what a huge change that would be. Mm -hmm. And in some ways it was, but in many ways it wasn't. And in one way that was very similar was that it was a for-profit model and it was a for-profit model that was under intense pressure. <laughs> And um, you can go check the BuzzFeed stock at some point later and see where it's at. You can go see what happened about a year ago to the investigative team. Um, and you will see that even some place like that, which had part of the pun or not pun, uh, had a ton of buzz at one point, <laughs> um, it, it, it still struggled with the for-profit model. So I feel, I'm not saying that there can't be money issues at a nonprofit. Obviously, yes. there are people who need to find the funders, and we need people, perhaps some people on this audience, to uh, <laughs> donate to some of these um, wonderful nonprofits. Um, but um, again, when I joined uh, ProPublica, um, you know, it was clear I was joining a place that had already gone through um, a period of growth and has a team and has people who are very expert at doing that kind of work. Um, and I think they're very proud of the fact that uh, more recently, even when there was a, uh, a funding stream that kind of dried up, uh, that there were gonna be no layoffs because of that. They were very proud of that fact, that we will find a way to make this work, even though I believe it was about some three to $4 million was no longer gonna be available to us. Hello. Uh this, gen this gentleman here has a question. Excellent. Mm -hmm. As non for profits, uh, you do have you. Do you make your uh, your news available? First of all, there's no paywall. Do you make it available to all of the other media outlets? As an example, Nikki, in your case, the IBJ, uh, the Star, uh, the radio and television stations. FYI, are they all willing to use it and give you credit uh, for? that information yeah I mean obviously since we're still in our first year I, I went through and and tried to email every newspaper in the state every TV station trying to introduce them to us explain their model um, some newspapers are caught right on and the IBJ uses our stuff constantly um, the star has not quite yet 
Um, they say they're fine with it, but they haven't yet done it. And, I, and I'm not sure if that's sort of still a little bit of the competition thing, you know. Um, but a lot of them are catching on and, and using our stuff and getting it out to people. Um, so that's going incredibly well. And when States Newsroom originally launched, I don't think they really thought the republishing part would be as big as it was. But so many people are so desperate and, and want to help their citizens. And like I said, you have newspapers who can't afford reporters. They can't afford AP anymore. So um, most of them have been very accepting. And I think it helped. I think if someone maybe who wasn't from Indiana, no one had existing relationships with, it might have taken a little longer. But because I've lived here so long and, and knew a lot of these people already, it has helped, I think, get our acceptance up pretty quickly. Gentleman in the green shirt. He asked, "How are these organizations um, able to deal with things like attacks, spyware attacks?" Um, I think all organizations and any business is worried about this issue in a big way. Have you had any issues? Anyone coming for you? I mean, <laughs> sorry, no, no, we've put that we've, out there. We've just started, and we've actually um, put in, you know, place measures to protect our software, protect our hardware, protect, um, you know, put in place practices so that our journalists protect the work that they're doing online. But it is difficult, you know. I think um, I think we all in the industry are really trying to are prioritizing that and figuring out solutions for it, but it's definitely an ongoing conversation. Yeah, I think in all three news organizations, there's always been um, training, you know, on how to avoid um, phishing and, th oh, and yeah. things along <laughs> those lines. And I know at, at ProPublica, again, there's an IT team that's really dedicated to keeping us safe, but um, I can't say we aren't immune. I'm sure it's possible. Yeah, we also have a national IT team, and we, you know, have to do the phishing training, and, and you know, they'll try to catch you and send you, like, an email and see mm -hmm. if you'll <laughs> click on it. So you have to be real careful. But we have at least, knock on wood, not have any issues so far. Uh, in the pink? This is a really good question. I think one that um, I've certainly struggled with in my career. Um, she asked whether or not there were some parameters um, put in place in, in your organizations when dealing with very difficult stories because there's a perception, sometimes it's a fair perception, that you know reporters are showing up and they don't care, they're just trying to get their story and they don't care that, you know, how they get it, even if it leaves a family, you know, suffering or re-traumatized. Um, do you have parameters that you've set up um, in case of that? I think we're somewhat fortunate in that we're not chasing the daily news as much, so we, we're not in the same position as um, somebody would be sent out um, to cover the, uh, sh a shooting that happened overnight. But we do we deal with a lot of people who have been traumatized, and I think there, there has been newsroom training about how to deal with that um, in, a, in a way that um, is, is sensitive and trying to avoid sort of re-traumatizing people um, and making sure that they, um, th that your approach is one that gives them one the option to um, not participate, but also if they, do, especially if they do participate, that it ends up being something that doesn't turn into um, t turn into another trauma. And so there's some there's some both outside training that we've received, but also just reporters talking around themselves um, about this internally. Um, it's I think it's an ongoing issue because obviously a lot of what we deal with is tragedy whether we're doing investigative work or breaking news. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the benefit of having <clears throat> a model that allows us to have local newsrooms um, and, and, and work on stories where our journalists live and where they're from is that part of what you're identifying is um, a problem with parachuting in, is what we call it in the industry, right? We're like a reporter who's from New York will go to Minneapolis and cover a shooting and then just leave. And that is the part that I think is in part adds to the trauma, right? So when you... And the other thing is that when those reporters are going in to cover the story, they're covering it for a broader audience. They're not covering it for the people who are like dealing with the actual issue, right? So when you live in a place and can stay in a place and people know your work and you're, you're sourced up and you can um, deliver on sharing information with the people who are being affected by the thing that you're covering, it changes the entire relationship. And so I think that's one of the ways that um, you know, capital B, we're set up in a way that allows us to really, to really do that. Yeah, a slightly different spin on that is obviously, you know, I think it's an ongoing education of how to treat sources um, and people you're dealing with so that they feel like they had a good experience, you know. Um, but also, one thing we've discovered, being part of this national uh, group, I think we're in 34 states now, and so we just this week got a memo today saying, look, you know, a lot of our reporters are covering some really heavy stuff right now, you know, from abortion to critical race theory to LGBTQ plus bills. And, you know, you have to sit in that building and listen to these terrible stories hour upon hour upon hour. And so um, we also want to make sure our reporters are being taken care of. And um, we have some counseling resources available. Uh, I've talked to my reporters about if they're ever uncomfortable covering something. Luckily for us, we have four of us, so we can move stuff around if they feel like that they can't do that in an unbiased way. Or if they just need a mental health break. I, I, you know, you guys were talking about something, and I just want to go back to it. Um, there's been a lot of complaints from us old people about millennials and Gen Z and like, I don't want to work the hours we worked. Good for you. Like, honestly, don't let us change you because we, we, we were outrageous and I'm still there. So I'm talking to me, <laughs> um, with our work ethic to the, to the detriment of our families, our society, our mental health, our on and on and on. Um, and I actually was quite happy to see this sort of new wave of people saying, hey, I, I'm not working 16 hours a day. Like, no, no, I'm going home. I need to take care of, I'm taking vacation. I'm, I'm learning from you all um, about how to say no, which I was really good at when I was two, and somehow it went away. <laughs> um, so you should be proud of sort of working towards something that is way more balanced, because it's actually better for journalists to be balanced and have a life, so you can see how people live. And don't just go and do your story. It makes you a, a, a more balanced citizen. Um, I think we're coming to a cl Oh, no, we've got one more. we got one more. Go ahead. OK. <laughs> Oh. Can I just add one more thing about, about balance? Yes, please. I mean, because I, again, look back at my own life, and I'm, I, I'm in some ways, despite the problems of the industry, I think it probably would be better starting out now <laughs> as far as um, having balance. But there, there also is a somewhat selfish side to balance in that you're going to probably have a longer-term relationship with that person, mm -hmm. that talented person that you've worked with, you will keep for a longer period of time. And you will develop trust and you'll develop a relationship. Um, and, you know, I remember telling a reporter, one of the reporters I worked with on the student ticketing project this year, I said, I will consider myself a failure if you do not take your vacation at the end of this year. We have to use up your vacation, you need to take it off. And I just feel like it's it's like it's the human thing to do, but there in the long run we're all better off because then they're not going to flee the industry. Right. They're right going to feel through. better about where they work, and you're going to and they're going to trust you. They're going to know that you care about more than just one thing. We've got two. I'm going to start here, and then I'll go to you in the red jacket. Yeah. 
I'll just quickly answer that since I'm still in the for-profit world, not well. <laughs> uh, she asked, how do you balance the stories that you want to do deeper dives on, that you, you know, really, really care about versus the ones that you have to do because they need content, you need to kick more stories out. Uh, how do you balance that without working 16 hours a day? Um, and I say not well because it's, you know, you have to fight all the time, and that's exhausting. You have to fight for the time. You have to fight for it. It takes time to do investigations. Um, and so it's a constant sort of battle. Like, I, you know, I, I really can't do this story if you want me to keep looking at this. And they said, well, how long is that going to take you? So it's a constant fight over time uh, and convincing, you know, your your editors, your, your bosses that it's going to be worth it in the end when they're thinking, well, what have you done for me lately? So it's hard. It's 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 not an easy thing. They're going to say, "Come to nonprofit." I can guarantee you. Well, See? I mean, not necessarily. See? I mean, obviously, <laughs> we do a lot of daily stories, but we also have enterprise stories we're working on too. I try to encourage my reporters to do at least an hour a day on a longer-term project, and that doesn't sound like a lot, but it'll build up. Um, you know, you do a couple interviews, a couple FOIAs spend an hour going through some some documents, you know, that, that builds up over time. So that's um, one thing I've done. So. Yeah, and I would, um, yes, you're right, Tara. Um, <laughs> come on over the side. But also, <laughs> I, think, I think you're hitting on something that I think is absolutely true for everyone in this room, that like, you know, this is, you're all learning the trade of investigative journalism and all that work is important. Like, getting your, your reps in is so, so important. Like the, in the earlier panel, I think there were some questions about how do you balance your time and how do you, you know, make sure you don't, you're thinking about different points of view. And like so many of those questions in this profession is worked out through the delivering of, of bylines. Now, that might sound like that's contradicting what I was saying about like don't work yourself to death. Mm -hmm. But I do think what you should do is Find an organization, and if you have, you know, if you have desires to go to a big for-profit place, maybe don't start there. Um, maybe don't start at the big place where you're going to have to be churning out a bunch of stuff a lot. But go to a, a mid-sized place, either a nonprofit newsroom. Um, if you can land a gig at a, you know, a, a, a regional paper or you know, anywhere, a, a, a digital site, that's going to give you like I would say an ideal pace would be like weekly or twice a week it just like gives you the opportunity to, to like you know produce but also like not at a breakneck speed and build up that um, capacity for writing build up that skill and then you can go to a place where you might ha have a little more room to say you know I'm not going to be doing you know clickbaity pieces eight times a week I don't know if this directly answers your question but one thing that I'll tell young journalists who come to me to, to ask a similar question, which is how do I get to, well, get to convince my editor to do a project or investigation while I'm doing all these other things, as I say, don't ever pitch them a project or an investigation. Right. Um, because they will immediately say, I'm going to lose you for the next six weeks or six months. Uh, you may never emerge. Who knows what it'll be? It'll be too long. It'll be a big hassle. So, but every editor wants a good story. So I would just say, think of it, and maybe and this is how you were describing it, enterprise. I have a great enterprise story. I just have a great idea for a story or an interesting idea. Let me, I've done a little bit of work already, and I found this little tidbit that nobody else has found. And, um, and uh, if I could just get in a couple hours a week to start doing more on it, I'd love that. And then as that builds up, maybe then you get your three weeks or three months or whatever it is. But it is a little bit of a game of how you pitch and how you sort of put yourself in your editor's shoes and think about what their needs and wants and fears are. Their fear is losing you for six months and you don't want them. So don't say the big P word, project. <laughs> um, last thing I'll say, real quick, is that you should do your research too, right? Yes. Like you, you were touching on this, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an older millennial, but I, you know, still had a lot of those old, you know, habits around just like working myself to the bone, but Journalists are on Twitter talking about their workplaces a lot, mm -hmm. um, the good and the bad. So 
do some journalistic work and figure out what organizations are treating their folks well, what organizations, you know, will give you the space you need to write um, at whatever, you know, cadence is good for you and use that as a resource. Uh, the gentleman in the red. Oh, high school teacher brought students with them. Hi. Yay, hi. <laughs> Well, I will say it's a lot different than when I was in school because we couldn't, we didn't have blogs. I mean, there are a lot of outlets that you have than just like the school newspaper that the, the principal controls, right? I mean, you can, you could maybe work with local entities. You could host your own blog. They can't stop you from printing stuff there as long as it's accurate and true. Um, so I, I think there are a lot more options out there than there used to be for high school journalists at least. I'm going to jump jump on that um, because I love the idea. I mean, look, every news organization, especially the for-profit one, sorry, but are trying to understand what young people think. Literally every single one. You guys are in a prime position to explain what's going on with your group of friends, with your group, how you guys are seeing some of the policies that are coming down, how it's affecting you, what it feels like in school when people are screaming at each other at a school board meeting, you know, what it feels like with the teachers, what it feels like to do a drill, you know, every other week that is, you know, maybe there's a school shooter. I mean, you guys are in a prime position to tell us what it's like to be you. Um, and so, like you said, you know, blogging, come, come together. You have a school newspaper. Form your own for a blog. You vote you all and get somebody who is. There are plenty of us who would volunteer uh, to look over copy. Um, it, you know what I mean? I mean to make sure because there are some legal things you do not want to libel someone or defame someone. You know there are things that you want to avoid, but you have a voice that's that's very different now because it can be widely read compared to you know the whole you know, yearbook, newspaper, you know, it was, it was the, 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 or the, or the announcements. I think I did announcements once. <laughs> I wasn't good at it anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, th there's a lot of, I think your voices um, can play a really important role because you know things that we can't know. I don't know half the acronyms you got. You guys are going to have to explain some of these acronyms on the, on the social media because sometimes I, I'm like, what does that mean? Um, but you guys know things we, we can't possibly um, no, that's happening amongst yourselves. Oh, uh, wait, one more thing, um, because I'd be remiss. Um, I joined this organization because of this young lady behind me. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, I have to tell you, the conversations that we get to have and the people that I get to, to talk to and work with, um, I am a little bit of a crazy person and I don't take my own advice, so I work insane hours, but um, they're a real resource. Um, the Arnold Center is a real resource. Um, the people that are on the board, um, many of them have done a lot of different jobs in journalism. Um, and so, you know, use them, talk about them, go look at what's on the website, go look at what some of the students are doing. And lastly, not to bring the room down, but I do want to recognize um, that there is a death of um, a journalist in Orlando. Um, it so happens that he is part of a group uh, that one of my friends runs, um, and I just found that out today, uh, and that punched me in the gut. 24-year-old Dylan Lyons was shot and killed covering a shooting. Um, a nine-year-old was also shot and killed in that same spree. Um, her name was Tiana Major, and his photographer is in critical condition. Jesse Walden is in critical condition right now. Um, so please understand that this job is dangerous in this country. It's dangerous in a lot of different countries, um, and this is like my worst nightmare to be covering something, and then you're gone, um, or your colleagues hurt. Um, 
just be mindful um, that there's a lot of journalists out there that are that are that are really upset over this. Thank, thank you for that, Sarah. We opened our session today talking about um, those people that got hurt and um, killed. Um, where's the high school group? You guys are the luckiest high school in America because Sarah Seidner from CNN just volunteered to read your blog. So, so read and edit. So do it. Do it. And edit, right? Yeah. And edit. It. I still um, can't spell, by the way, so you're going to have to have someone else do that. <laughs> um, thank you, guys. That was great. I really appreciate it. So a couple things. Um, we're going to clear the hall because we have to redo this for Paula's speech. We've got to change the table and everything. So um, we'll come back here at 5 o'clock. Um, I hope you'll join us. Paula Levine is, is really one of the top reporters in the country, investigative. Um, she, they're also, IU Bookstore is also selling her book outside. So if you'd like to buy her book. I'm sure she'd sign it for you later, but um, please rejoin us at 5 o'clock, and don't forget about the mixer later on after the session. After Paul is done speaking, you can meet all these journalists um, up close and personal. Thank you. That was really good.